ладно, не орти. Вы любите Lost and Vivo так же сильно, как и люблю я? Если нет, то вы определенно не смотрели мой обзор на нее. Почему ты это еще не сделал, дурашка? Пойди и посмотри, купи игру, а потом поставь лайк видосу, если понравится. Или нет, даже если не понравится, поставь лайк, а потом посмотри еще несколько раз на повторе. Смотри его с родственниками вместо телевизора. Ставь фоном, когда будешь заниматься сексом. Похить бомжа и заставь его смотреть мои обзоры. Пока будешь заниматься с ним сексом. Нет, правда, комменты и лайки помогают продвижению канала. А то вдруг вы не знали. Если вкратце, то Lost and Vivo это survival horror шутер от первого лица, вдохновленный лучшими тайтлами ужасов эпохи первого и второго PlayStation. Многие даже лаконично называют игру Silent Hill от первого лица. Знаю, звучит прямо как возрождение survival horror, но Акума Кира это первый на моей памяти человек, который научился играть на ностальгических струнах души олдскульных хоррор-фанов, при этом не используя кривое управление и неповоротливую боевку. Это были лучшие 300 рублей, которые я потратил на хоррорный контент за последние два года. Основная сюжетка проходится всего за 4 часа, но дополнительного контента контента в игре хватит еще на несколько тайтлов. Бонусные мини-истории, режим ремикса врагов при повторном прохождении, прямо как в режиссерской версии Resident Evil. Эта игра напоминает мне бездонную коробку с игрушками, в которой чем дольше копаешься, тем больше сюрпризов для себя находишь. Что мне дальше продолжать? Всего 300 рублей, ребята! Поход в кино, и то будет дороже. Мы живем в таймлайне, где Silent Hill умер и никогда больше не вернется, поэтому я готов взяться за любой шанс испытать те же впечатления, что когда-то подарила мне первая часть. Я получил свою дозу психологического и сюрного хора, и вам же советую в него окунуться. По традиции, после выпуска обзора я как типичный видеоблогер решил устроить стрим по Lost and Vivo и был беспредельно удивлен количеству вопросов, которые вы накидали насчет разработчика. Одни обрадовались приятной находке, удивились, что не слышали о нем раньше. Другие спрашивали об источниках вдохновения. Кто-то начал строить теории насчет сюжета и подметил, как метко автор описывает разум терзаемой депрессии. Я решил, что нежели чем строить свои беспочвенные догадки, лучше обратиться к автору напрямую и без лишних надежд на отправил ему в Твиттере предложение побеседовать. И, к моему удивлению, разработчик достаточно оперативно ответил и согласился на интервью. Поэтому без лишних слов, господа трэш-пассажиры, прошу любить и жаловать. Перед вами создатель Lost and Viva и Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, Акума Кира. And hello there, Kira. Good morning to you. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, yes, good morning to you too. Uh, well... Or good evening or afternoon. I'm not sure which. I forgot. Uh, yeah, I believe so. It's about uh five p.m. in Russia. But nah, who cares? I never open my blinds anyway. Who needs sun when you're a horror fan, right? But I digress. Um, let's start. What was the first game that got you interested in horror genre or game development? Ah, uh, that's difficult to say. Um, it might have been Castlevania. Um, into game development, um, but into horror specifically um, was probably Silent Hill. Um, although I started with um, Silent Hill 2, I didn't play Silent Hill 1 until later. But it as a series um, was definitely a main inspiration. Wow, yours too! Wait, was it the first Castlevania on NES or some other title in franchise? Because for me, it was like the first video game ever. I definitely see some parallels between us. Your favorite Silent Hill is 3, if I remember correctly. Mine too. We both like Castlevania. Oh my god, I'm such a fangirl, sorry. Uh, well, I was thinking of like Symphony of the Night, and um, it made me... Um, aesthetically want to make games that looked like that, I guess. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, a game that really got me into game dev would be Morrowind, actually, because of the um, construction set that each game, each Bethesda, like the early ones had, where you could make your own maps or uh, scenarios within it. And that's what really, I guess, made me start game dev. Do you play your own games from time to time? I remember you said in another interview that the reason why you got into game dev was that you ran out of games to play. So, did your projects fill that void? I guess it would be really hard to play one's own games after so much time, effort and nerves were put into them. Um, typically, while I'm working on them, I'll also play them every now and then, which I think helps me like set the pace for certain games. But um, usually now, when I want to go back and play an old game, I'm not the one playing it, I'm subjecting one of my friends to it for the first time and getting their reactions, which I find a little more fun than me just playing through it again. 
How much of your own psychological experiences were put into Lost in Vivo? It's especially unsettling when the game tackles some uncomfortable subjects that you might personally struggle with, like aftermath of abusive relationships, depression, body image issues, paranoia. For me personally, it cut way too close to a bone. It feels like author just got his hand into your skull and is digging around in your darkest fears. And I'm not the only one in this episode. Observation. Some players even said that they questioned themselves. Like, is this game a metaphor for fighting your demons or am I just projecting my thoughts into it? So, how much of yourself was put into the game? I did put uh, a good deal of my own experiences in the game, but I also went over a few that I didn't directly experience, that I uh, just learned about through research or through being friends with people who have gone through stuff like this. And following previous question, is the story of Lost in Vivo trying to teach us something? Maybe you wanted to help people with aforementioned issues? Uh, I tried to make it a experience of those issues and of um, depression in general, but be a hopefully optimistic one where you can get through it um, and emerge victorious. I know that's not always the case with some people. Uh, some people, you know, have a harder time fighting their issues than others. So I thought just by depicting a few elements of the game like that would be beneficial to people. And judging by feedback from my subscribers, it really was. I think it's really great that we have more serious horror games now that not only scare us, but also could serve as some form of therapy. It was therapeutic for me at least. What are the craziest theories you heard about Lost in Vivo? It's deliberately vague about what is actually going on with protagonist. Every ending gives a different spin on whether it was all real or just a hallucination. It was a huge mindfuck, I tell ya. And then you play it again, and it becomes even bigger mindfuck. When, for example, in intro you find a newspaper that mentions the lab, or missing person poster with exact photo you find a little later in one of nightmare sequences. When I first heard about your game from a friend, it was something like good horror roller coaster ride. Which I think doesn't give it justice, it's got to be something deeper. Uh, I've heard a lot of theories, uh, but none in particular come to mind as being the wildest. I tried to basically have a few different plots ongoing at once. Uh, for instance, there's like the Dante's Inferno side of things, where you can see the uh, the river sticks and an oar with Charon written on it, or Charon, I don't know how uh, it's typically pronounced when you cross over into hell, and then um, there's references to what ring you are in hell, like written on the calendar and things. But there's also um, other ways where it's been vague, and um, I kind of left it up to interpretation. My thoughts were um, that if I implied a story vaguely, it would be better than having a set story that I forced the player to accept. Um, or the other side of the spectrum by going completely abstract and um, the story being so vague that you didn't have any sort of theories to build on. So I kind of tried to be somewhere in the middle for that. And what do you mean by too vague? Dear Esther comes to mind when you say that, which is a great game aesthetically, but by god I still don't have a clue what is it all about. Um, I haven't played Dear Esther, but um... One of my inspirations is uh, David Lynch's work, but a lot of criticism people put on David Lynch is that he doesn't have a set story in mind, and he's just being completely abstract, which I don't think is the case, but I didn't want to go as abstract as, say, uh, David Lynch's work, so that it would be a little more digestible as an indie horror game. But. Are we just a little bit close to truth when we think the protagonist is female? Some of the notes we find in the game talk about bulimia, which is eating disorder that is most common among women, and others mention abortion, which, uh, you know, could be a very big hint. It's a very common theory that all the notes we find in the game are thoughts and past traumas of player character manifested in physical form. Um, have you played Spec Ups the Lion? Um. No, I haven't, um, but I know that it has a, um, a twist sort of like that near the end. 
Uh, yes, not only that, there are also two kinds of transition between cutscenes. There is classical fade to black and also fade to white. What developers said about this decision is that when you see fade to white, it marks a moment where events went little different to how protagonist remembers it. I thought that maybe prologue in Lost in Vivo kinda uses the same technique. Maybe a bit with poster with her own photograph is a sort of a bad omen for player character akin to a doppelganger or maybe a hint for a kin eye. So a little later when you see the same photo in the puzzle you might think oh I've seen it before it can't be a coincidence now even walking the dog scene might be a hallucination. Um I was trying to imply that like they were kind of a blank canvas so you could do whatever you want. A lot of people think that um Jane um is spirit the girl with the, um, the the most issues in the subway is the protagonist. And that is a very common theory. I didn't per se mean to uh, like say you are that character. I just wanted you to be like, um, you're kind of in the same place as that character and you help them move on in the end. But a lot of people just assume that is you're the player character. But yeah, I tried to just put um, kind of like a uh, what do you call it? Just like a foreboding uh, message of Jane, and then there's one of uh, Dr. Brundle. And I don't think I made a third one, but I was, I meant to, but I couldn't find the right symbols to use. In my community, there are a lot of people who were inspired to become game developers after looking at projects like Cry of Fear by Andreas Roenberg and Team Sci Scholar, Harvester Games and Rem Mikalski with The Cat Lady, Jasper Byrne with Lone Survivor, and of course you with Lost in Vivo. But despite that tools for game development are much more accessible now than, say, 10 years ago, it's still not an easy task. What are the most common trappings of beginner game developer that might potentially kill the project or demotivate you or stretch its development to unreasonable length. I don't want to poke a dead horse, but everyone knows a sad story of poor little Yandere Dev. Um, I think a lot of people, well, it's the two different sides. Uh, like, a lot of people will start with Unity, which is a good place to start. Um, but they'll either not use um, their own assets and they'll be using everything from the store, which eventually um, you'll get burnt out on because when it comes time to make custom things for the game, they'll find themselves lacking in that. But on the other side, there are people who want to immediately make their own um, 3D models, sounds, and music. And that is a huge time sink sometimes. Um, and I think the best thing to do is to collaborate on things like that with uh, other passionate indie developers and 3D modelers. I'm not a good um, representation of this though. Uh, I haven't collabed with a lot of people. Uh, I started from a programming side and then I eventually went to 3D modeling and then music um, and animation. But it, it took me um, you know, a really long time to get to where I am now where I can make the assets on all those levels. Because uh, I started making games when I was like, 12 and I'm 29 now so I've had a lot of time to try and a lot of time to fail uh, I've worked on one game for uh, three years that uh, was a complete failure and only sold like four copies so uh, the best thing to do is just to start making small games and get them out there and you'll learn mostly from experience and unless you can um, you know afford and go to a good game design college uh, which will certainly help you as well. So uh, let's summarize. Don't fall into perfectionism, start with smaller projects, don't be afraid of mistakes, find a team of like-minded passionate people if you lack some skills, and you might just be new Hideo Kojima in waiting. Yes, I think that's a great uh, summary. Because uh, that's, that's the main reason my games take so long. How many times during the making of Spooky's House or Lost in Vivo you had to change something about the game that made it into something you did not expect your project to be? It's, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, I guess Spooky's changed the most during development because uh, it started as a very small satirical game. Like, the, um, the Thousand Rooms was a joke. I never intended to make a thousand rooms or make the player go through a thousand rooms, but it happened anyway. Um, 
With Lost in Vivo, uh, it didn't really change so much. I left the ending of the game pretty ambiguous when I started writing it, and I wrote it as I worked on it, so it did change a little bit in story, mostly. Um, the most it changed was uh, it could have been a lot smaller. Like, um, originally could have ended right after the um, subway, uh, but I, I am glad I extended it as much as I did. A lot of the extending um, wasn't from a writing perspective, but it was actually just for Steam because they have a uh, system where if you play a game for less than two hours, you're allowed to refund it for full price. And um, I know a majority of people wouldn't do this, uh, but some people will play a game, complete it within two hours, refund it, and then move on uh, without having to pay for it. And I was kind of afraid people would do that with my game because I had a lot of investment in it and I needed it to make some money back. Um, but I don't think a majority of people do that and that's something you should worry about for Steam. I think they've also changed the refund policy to be based on game hours now um, and the game price. So capitalism ho I guess. It's quite obvious that you often take inspirations from older horror games like Silent Hill or Clock Tower and I really understand why. They got a lot of stuff right back then. But what are the things you did not like in old survival horrors? Not so much old survival horror, but kind of the middle ground between now and, um, like, the old uh, fixed camera angle Resident Evil games. Somewhere in the middle, I feel like they started to lose their focus and mostly uh, went on action. And um, you can kind of tell when, as graphical fidelity got better, people wanted to showcase how good something looked and not the uh, gameplay and the... Um, making the general layout as well. Um, there's not really anything in particular I can pin down as something I don't like in survival horror, especially old survival horror. Like, uh, I'm fine with tank controls and fixed camera angles. I think it's really good. Sometimes you can tell a game didn't have as much budget and they cut corners uh, in old survival horror. Um, something like uh, the Thing game for the PS1. Uh, you can kind of, it's a good game, but you can kind of tell um, it's a little bare bones at times. Um, but yeah, no, there's nothing like specifically that I hate about old survival horror that I can see as like a trope to avoid. I understand where are you coming from with this thought. Nowadays, many developers think that the only way you could introduce a new monster is in special cutscene with a little song and dance, when it's much more natural to make them first appear during the gameplay without any warning, because otherwise it looks more of a movie than a game. Yeah, I think after, well, you could pin it down on Resident Evil 4, even though that's a great game, but uh, studios started to focus more on action to appeal to a more general audience, and I think that's when they stopped being scary. Well, I don't think they were shooting for pure horror with RE4. It's more of a honest, tense action with some scary moments put in to make them pop as sort of highlights. Yeah, and I think Resident Evil 4 is a pretty good game still, and it has some solid horror in it. But uh, um, I guess mostly also their use of quick time events kind of um, it wasn't so bad in their case, but it inspired other companies the wrong way, <laughs> and they... Uh, a lot of people took the wrong elements from RE4 afterwards, that's what I feel like. Or more like inspired to make a lot of shameless ripoffs akin to Dead Space. RE4, but in space. You know, this got me thinking. I love just about everything about Silent Hill franchise. Atmosphere, characters, sound design, music, but fighting system is the thing that always quickly turns boring. Seen one skinless dog, seen them all. And this is where Lost in Vivo excels at. Every enemy has its place, every encounter is memorable. It seems that sometimes for a horror game, it's much better to have lower budget. Well, it's kind of a, a balance because I also, I'm not a big fan of the um, amnesia style modern horror game where there is no combat and there is no action. I feel like you can have a good balance. But also, um, in old survival horror games with the uh, the, you know, the clunky combat mechanics. I feel they can be a benefit to the horror if they're done, like, if they tread that fine line between, like, feeling underpowered for what you have to overcome and being frustrating. 
I feel like there's a fine line around that and you have to kind of be right on it and uh, some players are going to be on one side or the other depending on their skill level or just their um, their patience with the game. Since your games are mostly in retro style, what do you think about modern horror games? Are there any games that impressed you lately? Uh, I, I really liked Resident Evil 7. Uh, I thought that was pretty good and the, uh, the remake of RE2. Uh, those come to mind. I haven't played a lot of modern horror. Um, like I want to play games like uh, Scorn. Um, and there's a few others that um, I knew I'd like. I just haven't got around to yet. Uh, I think where the industry is is they could make really good horror games, but I feel like um, in most cases the big publishers with all the money aren't interested in it because there's not enough money in it. Um, and I think Capcom is an exception to this a little bit uh, just because that's what they're known for at the moment and they can you know put everyone else on Monster Hunter when they don't want to make a horror game um, but I, I think like graphic fidelity wise we are the industry is so equipped to make a good horror game but I don't think that they're going to anytime soon except for maybe uh, Resident Evil at least that's what I see right now um, and I'm hoping that the um, the double A games like um, Ninja Theory's um, Senua uh, Sacrifice. I, I feel like those would be where we're going to get good experimental horror games uh, eventually. But we'll have to see the rise in that um, kind of uh, game budget and uh, we'll have to see more games in that style. Oh wow, you like RE7. That's quite unpopular opinion these days, and I think I'm gonna go off the script here. If I'm not mistaken, you said before that you think Best Silent Hill is the third, which also gets a lot of unjust hate these days. So why exactly do you like Silent Hill 3 the most? Well, I think mostly, uh, like, Aesthetically and gameplay wise, um, it's the best of the original four, um, at least for me. And um, like, I like different Silent Hills for different reasons. Um, I think Silent Hill 2 is the most cerebral. Um, I, I think the third one has the gameplay and the diversity that I like the most, and the locations that I like the most. Um, and I think 4 has the best uh, creature designs. Um, and I haven't played enough of one, but it is so impressive, especially for it being on the original PlayStation. And if I had played it when I was a child, it would definitely still be my favorite. But uh, I think I'm drawn to three just because for me, it's the best out of um, all the elements that I like about Silent Hill, um, including the soundtrack. It's the, the one I identify the most with, I guess. And another sub-question for your last take. Why do you think people tend to look down on horror genre? I think maybe they think of it as like a pulpy, easy genre to make. Um, and they see it as, I don't know, kind of in a, in a Christian light. They see it as bad and like of the devil, maybe. <laughs> and um, they just see it as a lower brow entertainment for some reason. Um, same way, I guess, people will see uh, wrestling in the sports world compared to, you know, football in America. Uh, I don't know why so many people see it that way. I think, I mean, I think it definitely has its merits along with any genre. And, it, you know, it's my favorite genre, so I'm extremely biased in this. Um, but I really don't know why society as a whole is so against uh, embracing it in the mainstream but maybe it's because the nature of horror is so subjective it's hard to make a horror movie or horror media in general that um, you know is appealing to a very wide audience because um, some audiences are very particular and I think that's why also we have the the terrible horror movies like The Nun who just try to scare a wide audience with loud noises and uh, creepy face. Do you hate sewers in video games? Lost in Vivo is a very, very big exception, but usually if I see sewers in just about any game, I immediately understand that I'm about to fall asleep at best or 
rage at confusing level design at worst. So, how did you manage to make sewers so interesting and varied? Were you not afraid that people might get bored in a game that almost exclusively takes place in sewers or an underground? Uh, I did feel that since the environment was completely underground and claustrophobic, players might feel a little um, bored of the locations. I tried to make up for it with like the griminess and the detail in certain areas. And I know my game is not the um, the epitome of detail, it having the aesthetic it does and the budget it did. Um, but a lot of, uh, I think the reason games go towards sewers as the, the best, uh, the easiest level design location is the corridor and sewers uh, in most video games are nothing but corridors and hallways and uh, very simple long passages um, and you know Sp Spookies my other game was like only that basically um, except for the specimen rooms so I guess try to make up for it being mostly long tunnels I try to change it up ever so often and um, make interesting rooms within it and uh, I tried to make it look more urban decay and uh, a little more grimy so you'd have at least something to look at it wouldn't just be the same modular pieces over and over again are you planning to make games in other genres than horror? I like Midnight Mode, it's so fucking addictive. I would like to see it as standalone title so I could pour hundreds of hours of my life into it. And I think it also gives you a possibility to scare a shitless in unexpected way. There are a lot of non-horror video games with sudden creepy parts that actually manage to be scarier than deliberate horror games. Yeah, I absolutely want to explore other genres, um, and yeah, you know, I'll probably always put some spooky thing in it. But um, it's funny that you mentioned Midnight Mode as a standalone game because um, I do have that in development. Um, it's pretty early um, production though, so I don't have anything really to show. But yeah, I've always wanted to make a um, like a first-person Metroidvania style game um, with. Uh, like a lot of RPG elements, just basically first person Symphony of the Night, I guess. Um, and I did start working on it, and uh, I have no clue when I'll have something to show because I've been busy with uh, subcontracting work uh, and other projects. But yeah, I like other genres too. I've made, uh, you know, bullet hell games, and uh, I've made platforming games. Uh, it just seemed like. Uh, I got the most attention for my first-person horror games, and I, I guess I like them the most, so that's what I've spent the most time on. What is your relationships with Let's Play or streamer culture? I don't know about you, but I just fucking hate that because of PewDiePie, Markiplier, and etc. People start to associate horror genre with chip thrills, when it could be so, so much more. But since Let's Plays with jump scare reactions just adamantly guarantee you lots of views, it puts pressure on game developers. I can only imagine disappointment Let's Players felt when after Amnesia they got Soma, which is mostly about existential dread and not monster chases or shock moments. It's a uh, constantly shifting relationship. Uh, I, uh, I definitely keep Let's Players in mind still when I make games, just to make... Uh, because uh, a lot of attention uh, comes from that and uh, you know, that's how originally I kind of got a big break because I was baiting PewDiePie a little bit when I made Spooky's House of Jump Scares and it just happened to work and then he oh Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion I should say since the um, the name has changed that was so long ago and I still call it that um, but um, I still I kind of owe Let's Players for the popularity and the sales numbers I get on my games it's Without a YouTuber, you know, circuit to promote these horror games, I don't think a lot of indie developers could afford to, um, at least the ones who are, uh, you know, living on their own and making their, they have to make money from their games to live. We couldn't do it without a publisher if we didn't have this YouTuber sphere. But I do think it negatively affects a bunch of games because you do start putting in you know, references to Let's Players and you try to make things more consumable for them. Um, I kind of also don't like the recent trend where, um, I mean, it's not only a bad thing, but 
uh, the doing like five horror games in one videos uh, without the game titles in the, you know, the um, the YouTube video title. I think it helps them gloss over a lot of games really quickly, which is good for them, but not so much good for the developers who put time into it. Uh, but I know the market is so saturated. I, I understand why that's becoming a trend. Uh, because it's necessary to get through it all if they want to try to approach covering any amount of the games that as they come out every year. So you think about them as some sort of uh, necessary evil. Yeah, in a way. Um, but I, I have good relationships with some YouTubers and some are definitely better than others. <laughs> what type of graphics do you think will be the next big craze in indie scene? We had NES and Sega type graphics from 2011 to 2018. Now we have PS1-like horror games. And uh, don't you think this is the end of imitation of old graphics for us? NES and Sega had pixel art, PS1 had wobbly 3D models, but after that, there is no special trait that characterizes graphics of, say, PS2 or first Xbox era. I think as, uh, you know, kids start growing up and they want to see games that remind them of their childhood, I think we'll actually, or what I'd least like to see is uh, horror games that take the Wii aesthetic <laughs> and a uh, point of graphics, because they're not too far off from... Uh, PS1 in, tour, in uh, terms of like poly count, uh, but I think there's things you could do to make it look more like a Wii, and I think it'd be uh, cool to see. But um, we also had handheld systems like the DS that grew up after the PS1 and stuff. So I think the aesthetic's not going to change that much that quickly. I think a lot of people are just going to kind of make it more colorful or try to. I don't know, try to capture what they're nostalgic for, but it'll still be nostalgic for the next generation because they'll have grown up with handhelds instead of growing up with the consoles that had about the same graphical fidelity. Phew, okay, that wraps up my part of interrogation. And now comes the time for a little blitz poll from our lovely community. Okay, so, how many dogs were harmed during the development of Lost in Vivo? <laughs> Zero dogs were harmed during death. Yeah. Craven, Mr. Craven, the YouTuber's dog Danny, was uh, very well cared for, and uh, he just, you know, like slapped the ground and stuff to get some barks. And uh, my dogs, the Boston Terriers that I recorded for extra sound effects, they were just kind of playing, so all the dogs are fine. What do you think about Dread X? I, I think it's a pretty cool opportunity to um, get to work alongside a lot of peers in the industry, um, so that's why I kind of like it. Um, and another way, I struggle with um, deadlines, and um, if I wasn't working with them, um, I, it would take me, you know, another year to get a game out. But since I have deadlines and they push me to finish a game, it kind of helps me to actually get some games out there. Because um, I do want to make, you know, three or four smaller games in between my multi-year long projects. What do you think about Clive Barker's works? And no, I'm not gonna read last part of this question. Uh, I've only read two of his uh, books, um, but I really like them and I of course have seen the Hellraiser movies. Uh, I think it's, uh, he has a very unique style um, that I kind of like. Uh, I know he's tried his hand at um, game design too. Uh, I haven't really tried his games that much so I'm not familiar with um, like if he has any unusual like style or flair that he puts in his uh, game design but I do um, I really liked the Hellbound Heart and uh, uh, I can't remember the other book what it was called but um, I think he has a pretty cool uh, unique style and um, I like it I just uh, haven't consumed his like body of work uh, in mass yet, <laughs> but it's on my list. Did you play games from Puppet Combo? And if you did, what do you think of them? Uh, I've only played maybe three or four of his games. Uh, I think they're pretty good and they all have, I, I feel like they, I don't want to make uh, him mad if he listens to this, but I feel like all of them have more potential than what they get, um, like what what is utilized in the game, but uh, I think that comes with the um, the game a month uh, format that he has. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, I, en I enjoy them. So they uh, they're usually more experimental than I uh, like would guess that they are. 
<laughs> upon starting them. How psychologically draining was it to work on Lost in Vivo, considering its subject matter? Uh, there was definitely some time mid-development when I had some... Uh, I was just very um, unenthusiastic about the game. But uh, usually, um, mid-development, I have to go re-immerse um, myself in the inspirations for the game to kind of like get myself inspired to work on it again. Uh, so it was a little draining about mid-dev, but uh, every game is, despite its subject matter. I feel like when you're dealing with uh, the unfun stuff, like uh, some of the programming, it, it can make anyone get kind of burnt out towards that area. What is the hardest part of developing a game? I just say just, uh, just to keep going and working on it, especially when uh, you work as I do alone in a room. You don't know if uh, anyone's going to like it or if it's any good sometimes because you're so familiar with it. At the end of Lost in Vivo, I was so familiar with the game that I couldn't really tell if it was a terrible trash Unity horror game or if people were really going to like it because I was so used to it. I wasn't sure if I made it good enough. Uh, so that's kind of hard to, like, near the end to... Make yourself happy about the project and uh, to know if you're doing a good job or not. Is there a way you thought to yourself a protagonist of Lost in Vivo should look like, or is this left purely to player's imagination? Uh, I meant it for the player to uh, like immerse themselves into the role or to imagine their own character. Kind of what I try to do with Spookies too, um, even though you can kind of see the protagonist uh, some of the endings. Just because, um, like James in Silent Hill 2, is meant to be a very blank character for you to project yourself on, I thought just no character, like not depicted at all, uh, would be easy to project yourself into and kind of role play. Name three good horror games. Uh, I'll have to think about, like, <laughs> what are three that I'd want to name drop? Well, I mean, some other than Silent Hill 1, Silent Hill 2, and Silent Hill 3. I'll try to say some from different franchises. So I guess I'll just say um, Resident Evil Remake, uh, Silent Hill 3, and Bloodborne. Uh, and Bloodborne counts as a horror game. Hey man, dude, Bloodborne is a horror game. Oh my god, it seems to follow me everywhere. But um, never mind. What were inspirations behind monster designs in Lost in Vivo? Um, well, it depended on the area I was working on. For the like the ghost of Jane, um, I actually just sketched it out first before it even had a place in the lore. Um, and then I made the lore fit the design, which is why she has like goat legs coming out of her abdomen. That's supposed to be like her unborn child um, is kind of breaking its way through in a way that's kind of depicted demonic. They don't, you can't really tell they're goat legs, but that's, that is what they're meant to be. Um, the subway train was like the opposite of that. It was written in the lore and then it was designed. And uh, I'm trying to think of another good um, example in the enemy design. Oh, uh, well, you can really tell the inspiration in the lab area with the rat people was, um, oh, how do you say his name, Belinsky? I believe it's Zdislav Biksinski. Yeah, yes. He, uh, I mean, I basically just copied one of his paintings as that design because I thought it was uh, really cool. What are the worst things developers shouldn't be adding in horror games, but they still do? Uh, one of my pet peeves is the default Unity flashlight texture. It's a, uh, it's just, I can recognize it immediately, and I, I feel like it's my belief that no matter your artistic, like, skill level, that anyone can draw a black and white image of a, of a white circle, because <laughs> that is what it is, and uh, every time I see it, it kind of breaks immersion for me. Um, but there's also other things, you know, like, um, jump scares that, like, like, will flash up and then immediately go away. I feel like jump scares are fine if the monster jumps out and then you have to deal with the monster, but jump scares aren't very effective when they show up and then they're immediately gone. Um, but you typically, there's not a whole lot of that anymore in indie dev. Uh, that was kind of a problem around like the 2012 games, I guess. Is the fact that you're a game designer cat somehow connected to all the dog abuse in the game? Uh, no, that's unrelated. Pay no attention to that. Um, 
me and my wife both had cat avatars, and um, somehow mine grew a third eye at some point. I don't remember when that happened. And I saved the best for last. What is the perfect recipe? For a jump scare. Cause I don't think the jump scare is supposed to be a dirty word. Yes, it can spoil your experience in horror game, but only if it's used poorly or excessively. Uh, this won't be a horror game example, but still, since we talked about David Lynch, there's a great scene in Mulholland Drive with man who lives behind Wilkies, and I think that every Every single person that makes horror games should follow its example. Yeah, I think that's a great example uh, for Mulholland Drive. Wait, was that Mulholland Drive or Blue Velvet now? Wait, yeah, it's Mulholland Drive. Yeah, I think a good recipe is you need some kind of build or the lack of a build, you know, just um, in an atmosphere which um, kind of will build to something. But no matter um, what you do before the jump scare, it has to be surprising and um, if you just do a scary face, it's not as surprising. It needs to be unexpected um, in, in the way that it's surprising. Like, something they wouldn't think would be a jump scare, I think, is uh, more effective. And then another thing is um, that it shouldn't dissipate immediately. They should have time to either process what it is or time to react at least a little bit before it's gone um which is why i thought that a jump scare of like an enemy in a game for instance will show up but then it won't go away and the player will have to deal with it because i think the moment where they're scrambling to remember how to deal with it is the uh, sweet spot of the jump scare а сейчас мы подходим к самой грустной части этого видео. Потому что наше интервью с Акумой Кирой подошло к концу. Он человек занятой, его время стоит денег. И если мы хотим увидеть еще больше интересных хоррор-игр, то больше задерживать его мы не имеем права. Я надеюсь, сегодня вы узнали для себя что-то новое, потому что я определенно узнал. And once again, thank you so much for answering, Kira. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. I hope we will meet sometime again. Oh, thank you so much for uh interviewing me and the questions were really nice uh so i'm always happy to talk about stuff like this thanks it was it was a lot of fun so thank you for having me Кири, это интервью, кстати, настолько понравилось, что он в качестве бонуса накидал мне ключей на Lost and Viewer. Их мы разыграем в моем паблике ВКонтакте. Ссылка в описании к ролику. Это был интересный опыт, который я надеюсь еще повторить. Пишите в комментариях интервью, с кем вы хотели бы услышать в будущем. В разумных пределах, конечно же. Ну а теперь пошел-ка я дальше работать над эпическим разбором Last of Us 2. А ну-ка стой, ковбой. У меня в последнее время стали часто спрашивать, как лучше всего кинуть мне монету за контент и сделать вклад в будущие видео. Поэтому всех новоприбывших и тех, кто не любит читать описание видосов, оповещаю, что с прошлого октября у меня есть аккаунт на Патреоне. И так как не все дружат с бусурманскими интерфейсами, я также завел страничку на отечественном сайте Бусти, чтобы уменьшить количество обвинений в русофобии. Ступени поддержки много, с самыми разными бонусами. Хватит на всех расточителей третьего круга до Данте. Но пусть вас не пугает их количество. Я одинаково ценю каждый прилетающий до Благодаря регулярным пожертвованиям с Патреона, я теперь могу оплачивать астрономическое количество картинок и анимаций каждому видео. Смог обновить ПК. Взять два харда для работы над несколькими проектами одновременно. Взять эту штуку для записи футажей со старых консолей в высоком качестве. Взять эту что? Упс, не та картинка. Так что подписывайтесь на мой Патреон и Бусти, чтобы поддержать проект и финансировать мою наркотическую зависимость.